First, I want to thank so many of you because over the past week you've texted, you've emailed, you've checked with me, not about my health, but about the shamrock shake issue <laughs> that I shared from the deepest parts of my heart with you last week. And thank you so much. Although I think I may have caused some others to stumble, I think because I brought it up, some of you that didn't even know about the Shamrock Shake McFlurry then made your own way to McDonald's and gave in to that temptation. We won't mention any names, but some of this group sitting over here, I think. It's great to be together. Welcome once again to our guests. We're always glad to have you as we worship God here in this place. And if you've been around the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ, we are a moving target. Things are changing. Things are always different. And today what's different is we have all the kids with us in the auditorium. The other thing that's different is there's no lights up here. So it's really dark. And I'm like, this, this, you know, but you, you just learn how to work with it. And I want to say thank you to the parents that responded to the email that went out just yesterday afternoon that we're going to have to change things up. Uh, this was not, I'll just say this, this was not our fault. Uh, we are working with a group and they realized some things. So they let us know and we've kind of had to scramble around. But thanks to the parents that worked it out and brought coloring books and snacks or whatever. And I think that does help. I also want to say though, when things like this happen, it does make us appreciate the children's ministry and people that really serve and give. And so let's give it up for the teachers. You know, I, I would have thought that they would have said, good, well today I get to be in church and I get to just chill and be a part of the service. And yet they set up tables in the foyer and they're going to help you with your background checks for those that have tried to go online and get it done and maybe you got some questions and so even today when they could have taken the day off they're here to serve they're here to help you so thank you uh, for the children's ministry and all that they do uh, with the fact that the kids are with us today I realized last week and of course last week was the first time I'd preached in a couple of weeks and so you got kind of two sermons in one I realize that and, and so maybe it went a little long Maybe there's a few more points than usual, a few more scriptures today because we got the kids. I'm going to try and dial it back a, get, a bit and keep us moving because I realize that we're all together. You know, children's ministry is not a recent phenomenon. A long time ago when Kim and I were able to travel to Jerusalem and we're taking the tour of the Holy Land and we're going to various buildings and seeing where the early church worshipped, we went to this one site and we saw where they would have worshipped. But then outside of that there was a pavement and the guide brought us over and he said, we want you to look at this. And they took us to a corner of the pavement and there in the stones, they had carved what was very clearly a children's game and a place for children to play. And he said, this is, you know, uh, Sunday school. This is children's ministry back in the early church. And so even way back then, they were trying to figure out what do we do? How do we keep the kids going? How do we focus? You know, how do we worship and all that kind of stuff? It's not a new phenomenon. It's March 1st. Welcome to March. Hard to believe. And so uh, Chip, who uh, really tries to keep all the various regions of the Greater Philadelphia Church going in the right direction, uh, we have various themes. And so if you've been paying attention, um, and by the way, if you are new here, it doesn't mean you have to come every week. Every sermon ha stands on its own. But really, we've tried to kind of walk through from the very beginning in January the idea of really... Uh, our separation from God and the need for salvation. We talked about that. And then in February, we, we finished uh, talking about the need for forgiveness, right? And, and, and so we, we kind of finished that up last Sunday and talked about that. But then in March, we do want to focus on really the, the solution to that dilemma of man being separated from God and our need for forgiveness. And the obvious solution is Jesus Christ that we need to make sure that we understand our need for Christ the Savior. That we need salvation, but we need Jesus. He's the right one to fix the problem. And so through the month of March, we're really going to spend time focusing on Jesus. And with that said, get your Bibles out. Let's go to John chapter 4. Thank you. And in John 4, and we're going to kind of work backwards here for a few minutes. But in John chapter 4, in verse 29, 
Jesus, of course, has been dealing with the Samaritan woman. And she's a, a woman that was at a well simply to draw water on that day. And in verse 29, after Jesus has this interaction with her, actually in verse 28 it says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the town and made their way to him. Drop down to verse 42. After the town's people gathered, it says, They say to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. We now have heard it for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Go from there to John chapter 1. In verse 43, it says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Drop down to verse 46. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approach, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me, Nathanael said. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still standing under the fig tree, and Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. The Jews were on a search. They understood sin. They understood separation. They understood the absolute purity and the nature of God. And they understood that they were separated from God and that someday God was going to provide a Savior, a solution, a Messiah that was going to come in and rescue the world. And so their antenna, being Jews, was turned way up. And they were looking. And now these young men and a woman at a well have actually come up and said, wow, this guy's really different. This guy, maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the Savior of the world that we've been looking for. Go to John chapter 1. You know, last week we spent some time in Genesis. And Genesis starts out in the beginning. But John chapter 1 also starts with the same phrase. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. We can just take that at face value, kind of a glancing blow there. But if we do a little bit of study and we understand in particular John's Gospel and that he was writing to a predominantly Greek audience, this would have really caught their attention. Because they really valued the word, logos, as it was said in Greek. And so anything that had to do with the word, whether the written word or the spoken word, or a divine utterance, that got their attention. And so John, as he's writing to a Greek audience, he's saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You know, if you want to do an interesting study, just do a walk through the Bible at the number of times where God says something and then what happens after he says it. Certainly in Genesis we see it as God spoke basically the creation into existence. God didn't physically have to form it with his hands. He didn't have to mold anything. He didn't deal with it in that physical way. He simply said, let there be light. And because of his very words, things were created. We see also that things happen because of the words Jesus spoke. In John chapter 12 and verse 48, when Jesus is talking to a gathering there, he talks about the end and he says, In the end there will be judgment and my words will be the judge on the last day. Once again, an emphasis on words. That that's the judge. That's what we're really going to get to. 
Later on in the New Testament, when we read 1 Peter in chapter 1, verse 23, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through what? The living and enduring word of God. That our salvation needs to come through the word. That it's not something where somebody gives it to us. It's not something that we can uh, work to achieve as uh, was spoken of uh, so uh, eloquently today with our communion in Ray. Uh, it's not by works. Our salvation actually comes through God's word, the spoken word. When people say, oh, I became a Christian at such and such a time, and you say, well, did you understand what you were doing? No, I just responded to an altar call. I just did what I was told by somebody. That, to me, is problematic. Because we're born through the Word of God without intense study of God's Word, then maybe we ought to go, wait a minute, I might need to back up through a few steps. But back in John chapter 1, not only do we see that in the beginning was the Word, but in 14, verse 14 it says, But then the Word became flesh, and we've seen His dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This would have blown the Greeks' minds. Word was what stopped them in their tracks. What's the word? And yet, John in his writing, it says, then that word became flesh. Speaking of Jesus, Jesus was the incarnate word of God. Word in the flesh on the planet so that he could relate to us and we could relate to him. That would have really stopped the Greeks. They, they, they couldn't really get their mind around that, that a human being could be God's word in the flesh. You know, they were amazed by that. They were amazed that word could become flesh. And yet for us, we've been brought up with the concept of Jesus because we live in a Christian culture, right? And so sometimes we actually respond the opposite way of the Greeks. We're amazed when we think about Jesus in the flesh, but we're less amazed by the words. Right? Maybe sometimes in your spiritual walk you have wished to just have been with Jesus when he was on the earth. To just be by the Sea of Galilee. To just be uh, around him when he fed the multitudes. To just be in the upper room as he offered up the Last Supper. And we kind of uh, romanticize and, and, and wonder maybe what would have been like if we were in that setting with Jesus in the flesh. And yet the truth of the matter is we need to understand that the word became flesh. Where the Greeks went from the Word to the flesh, we go from the flesh being Jesus back to the Word. Do you understand what I'm saying? That the Bible that we have is the Word of God. It's Jesus. It's not Him in the flesh, but it's His words, and it's living, and it's active, and it's powerful. And we need to see it that way. We struggle with this concept, don't we? We struggle with just getting time reading our Bibles. How much easier would it have been if Jesus said, let's meet Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock for a cup of coffee. We'd be there, right? Because that's Jesus. But to get up before work and get our Bibles out and read passages, we don't see it the same. And yet we need to see it like the, the, the Greeks saw the word. Powerful, mighty, transformative, and that that can have that impact in our life. You know, later on in the book of John, in chapter 6, verse 24, it says that a group went looking for Jesus. They went looking for Jesus in the flesh. I want to challenge us as a church to continue our search for Jesus, not in the flesh but in the Word of God. As we spend the month of March looking at Jesus, we're going to start going, oh, I got what I need in terms of Jesus. It's in the Bible. It's really what I need. It's what I need to study. It's like searching 
for treasure. Digging into the scriptures is like being on a treasure hunt. It's like really going for it. It's like saying, I want to, I want to find this truth. I want to figure this out. Go to Matthew chapter 13, a parable that you probably know. Matthew chapter 13. In verse 44, Jesus is speaking here and says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. You ever been on a treasure hunt? You ever had fun just getting out there and really trying to find something of value and you want to know, okay, I need clues, I need something. Well, we're going to do that right now. That today we, ha we have the opportunity to have the kids with us. And so we're going to take just a few minutes and have a little treasure hunt. So, up on the screen, you'll see a clue. And what's happened is there's a $5 bill hidden somewhere in this building. And we're going to let the kids 15 and younger take the clue and see if they can find out where the treasure is. The clue reads, shh, see, you're getting fired up now. <laughs> Unnoticed by all, yet just pass by, find news in print, and only waist high. In the open space, must under you look, scaled creatures do swim, yet not fear the hook. All the people in the room, 15 and younger, we're going to stand and take a fellowship break, and we're going to see if they can find the treasure, if they can figure out where it is. The first one to find it, go ahead and stand up, fellowship break. First one to find it, come to me. Come on in, have, have a seat. Looks like our winner is Emma Fantini. Is that right? Let's give it up. All right, she took some clues. She said, hey, I think I got this figured out. And maybe she was faster than everybody else because it wasn't a hard clue. But, you know, you can take that down. But, um, you know, it feels good to be on a treasure hunt where you know the treasure is out there and you know there's clues and you're going to get it figured out. But the truth of the matter is that's not the only way to gain treasure. Because although we had five dollars out there in the foyer, there was five dollars here in the auditorium as well and, and, and maybe somebody found that. I, maybe you just stumbled upon it. Maybe you saw something at your seat. You know, we're not going to point you out. Maybe you want to keep that to yourself. The guy in the story that discovered the treasure quietly went off and sold all that he had and came back. But you know, it's fun finding treasure, isn't it? It takes some effort. It takes some work. We go for it. But you know, we got to put our hearts into it. And I want to spend the rest of our time talking about that. Once again, the parable in Matthew chapter 13 was about two guys 
and one was a treasure hunter by trade. That's what he wanted to do. He, he had things figured out and there's a lot of exciting stories about ships that have been wrecked off our coast at various places and people that literally spend their lives trying to find where these ships are and get inside and find treasure and those are exciting stories. But you know, sometimes we also just stumble upon. We also just, you know, you hear stories about people that are going to put something, build something in their backyard, and so they start digging around and they find something that's of great value. They weren't looking for it, but there it is. You know, searching for Jesus is a lot like that as well. But we've got to realize that it takes effort. You know, we are very Western in our thinking and our approach, okay? We, we have a way of gaining information through our educational system and other ways where somebody in authority or somebody that has training will then pass on that information to us, okay? We're very used to that. And then we get tested on it or quizzed or we've got to pass some sort of exam to get to some next level. That's very Western in our thinking, right? You know, back in Jesus' day and really with Jewish heritage, that's not how they went about it. In fact, a Jewish rabbi would not just give out information. A lot of times the teaching was to instill curiosity, but then also motivate the recipient, the hearer, to get in and dig. Back over in Matthew chapter 13. In verse 12, he says in verse, uh, in chapter 12 and verse 11, sorry, nope, let's go to chapter 13 in verse 12. I'll get it together here in a minute. He says in verse 13, <laughs> this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For the people's hearts have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, I might, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. And in turn, I would heal them. What's Jesus saying? Because the disciples are coming up and saying, Master... Make it a little easier. This is, you're like the, the, the student that's being tutored, right? And this is a, a chemistry class, and, and it, it's way over your head. And really what you'd like that tutor to do is just what? Give you the answers. But that's not what the tutor's supposed to do. The tutor's supposed to teach you how to dig, how to think, how to get it. Because then that will really develop your knowledge from the inside out. God is exactly the same way. The disciples came to Jesus and said, just give us the answers. Don't tell us these long parables and give us these stories and all that. Because we get confused and, and people walk away confused. And you're losing some of your people, Jesus. Just give out the answers. And Jesus comes back and says, no, you don't get it. I purposely want to make it a little hard. I purposely want to make it to where some just say, you know what, I don't have time for this. I'm moving on. Because Jesus is saying what God really wants is our hearts to be in pursuit of him. Very different from Western learning, more like Jewish tradition, more like Eastern learning. I'll give you a little, little information here. Because the Jewish approach to Bible study, Jewish hermeneutics, which is called Perez, um, they had four different types of of approach to scripture. They have what's called Peshat. Peshat is when you look at a text or maybe a story in scripture and you look at the surface or the literal meaning. And that's a lot of what we do. Okay, we, we look at a parable like uh, the Pearl of Great Price or other stories and we look at it and we get the meaning and, and, and that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's surface, you're going for literal, but that's okay. But then the Jews would take it to another level. After Peshat, they had Ramez. And Ramez is where they would take the story, 
or a parable like when Jesus would tell a story. But then they would try to find an Old Testament passage that helped support that New Testament parable. That New Testament story. They would begin to link God's word. They wouldn't go to a whole bunch of commentaries because there weren't commentaries. They had God's word and they said, okay, I don't really understand this. But it does remind me of a similar thing that I read about in Ezekiel. And so let me go back to Ezekiel and that's, that's Remez. Drosh is the third. And that's where you continue to drill down and gain even deeper and deeper wisdom. Where it's a passage that you've been stumped by and you've really had to work at it and look at God's word and really try to find the deeper truths. You know, I've shared quite a few times, I think, my study of why Jesus cursed the fig tree. That's a tough passage. And I remember thinking, I don't want to ignore this anymore. I finally got to get this figured out. It's in the Bible. It's God's word. Why would Jesus curse a fig tree? And it took a lot of study and a lot of work, a lot of drilling down, a lot of looking at supporting passages. But then it finally, the penny dropped, as we used to say in England, where I went, that's it. That makes so much sense. I love this story. I'm going to preach this all the time. Because you begin to see how God puts it all together. That's Drash. The last one, the fourth level, is called Sud. And Sud is where the Jews believe that as you continue to drill down, God then imparts additional wisdom to you that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. It's like a whole different transcendence, a whole different level. But you know, that's what the Jews were expected to do, is really continue to stay in the Word. To continue to drill down. To really continue to search for the truth and not give up. And I'm afraid that's not us today. The word became flesh. Lived a while among us. But then Jesus went back to heaven. But we have the word of God. Are we eager to drill down? Are we eager to study it every day? To make it a daily diet. Because it is like food. It, 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 you know, you have your breakfast in the morning, right? Even if it's on the run, you manage to figure out how to eat breakfast. Maybe you're driving and drinking a cup of coffee and eating a biscuit or something, whatever. But we manage to figure that out. And yet we don't manage to figure out how to feed on God's word on a daily basis. We've got to change that. We've got to do better. We need to commit to every day getting time in God's Word. To close, three very quick steps to better Bible study. If you want to have a better Bible study, step number one is care. Just care. Care about it. Want it. Really see that we need it. That it does change us. I, I guarantee you, the people that are in their Bibles on a daily basis are doing better spiritually <laughs> than the people that are just winging it or just showing up or barely are just hanging on by a thread. Get into the Word. It will strengthen you. Care about it. Want it. Love it. Figure out how to get it in your life. Care. The second one is bear. <laughs> B-A-R-E. Bear. Not grizzly bear. Bear your soul. Bear your soul. Let the word do the work. Last week when we were talking about forgiveness, we talked about some pretty touchy areas. We talked about needing to get honest. We talked about needing to get help. We talked about needing to get open with maybe a challenge in your life. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe your relationship with your kids is not what it needs to be. Maybe it's you that has an issue with internet pornography. Maybe it's, it's, it's another issue. You're angry all the time. What is it? But we've got to bear our soul and let the Word do the work. We've got to get honest and say, you know, I stink at this. Or I messed up. Or I messed up again. I had another shamrock shake. Doggone it. You know, I didn't, by the way. But I'm saying, that's, that's the sort of stuff that we just got to go, you know, I'm not doing that great. And I got to get open, and I got to get open and honest and let the Word do the work because our sinful natures are strong and they do mess us up. So, first, care, second, bear, and then lastly, simply share. 
You know what will strengthen you in the word faster than anything else? Sharing it with other people. Sitting down with somebody that maybe doesn't know the Bible at all. Or maybe they know the Bible better than you do. Either way, you're going to grow. You're going to change. You're going to be transformed because you stuck your neck out. You said, you know what? I'm going to go for it. You know, the woman at the well, when she came in contact with Jesus, she went back and said, come see a man that told me everything. She couldn't help but share. She couldn't help but speak. She couldn't help but, but bring it up and say, listen, I can't keep this inside of me. You know, a lot of us, when we come out of the waters of baptism, boy, we are so eager to share. We want to tell everybody about it. We're, we're, we're just on fire because it's so clear and it's straight from God's Word. But then that gets tamped down after a while, doesn't it? And we're not as eager to share. We've got to get back to that. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. But the Word became flesh and lived a while among us. We're going to spend March pursuing Jesus and learning about Jesus. But the starting plate is not to lament not being around Jesus when he was physically on the earth. But instead to just go, you know what? I got Jesus right here. I can grow, I can feed, I can, I can be transformed because I have the Word. And that's all that I need. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for giving us time together today. Thank you for the families, the kids, our chance to be together. Help us to rejoice in our fellowship, but help us more than anything to decide and recommit to dig into your Word, to really love the Word, to realize that we don't need Jesus in the flesh because we've got the Word. And that will strengthen us and help us to move ahead and be close to you. We do love you. Give us a great fellowship. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and have our final song.